Okay, hello and welcome back everybody. Today we're going to start with our first couple of kingdoms and we're also going to talk about things that are non-living but do impact us in our everyday life. So let's remind you of the definition of life. Remember that all living things have to have metabolism, they have to be organized, they have to be made of one or more cells, they have to reproduce as a species, um, they have to react to stimulus in their environment. So these are all, you know, those are five of the big ones that you need to know for definitions of life. Well, the first two things we're going to cover are things that aren't alive and uh, they still impact us on our daily basis. The first one is prions. Prions are simply protein segments that can cause disease. The discovery that proteins alone can transmit an infectious disease has come as a considerable surprise to the scientific community because they're often just changed from a normal protein by one or two amino acids. Uh, so this is basically a translation error. Although they're, they aren't alive, they can self-replicate because when they touch a sister protein, they can cause it to twist and change shape or conformation, which causes a greater spread of the disorder. So in animals, there's three biggies. Um, there's scrapie, which you find in sheep, and it was the first example of this disease. Um, and it's been known about for several hundred years in sheep. And there are two possible methods of transmission in sheep. Either infection of the pasture with the placental tissue, in other words, a ewe gives birth to a lamb out in the pasture, and that placenta carries the prions, and then another sheep comes around and eats the grass that's been touched by that prion. Or it, it's also been shown that it can be inherited. In other words, the mother can pass it to the babies. There's also um, one that's not shown here. It's called transmissible mink encephalopathy, which obviously happens in mink. Chronic wasting disease is a problem here in Idaho because it affects mule deer and elk. And there's, of course, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is mad cow disease, which we've all heard about. So prion diseases are often called spongiform encephalopathies because the postmortem appearance of the brain, which you see on the left, is very different from the one on the right because it creates large holes in the brain, in the cortex and the cerebellum. And probably most mammalian species develop these types of diseases. We just don't generally know about it. Um, we know about it most in the animals that we eat because those are the ones that we're examining their brains a little bit more carefully. Okay, now on to the human diseases that are caused by prions. And um, there's a couple of them. I'm going to only refer to them as their um, abbreviations. So there's Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, gertzmann strassler schneider syndrome, which is why I don't say that one very often, and fatal familial insomnia. Say that five times fast. So humans are susceptible to several prion diseases or prion diseases. I'm going to go through each one. Um, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the one that is most common, and it is about the rate of one per million people per year that comes down with this. And one, it, it's estimated that 1 in 10,000 people are infected with CJD at the time of death. And these figures are likely to be underestimated because these, these, these diseases often look like other diseases. For example, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease occurs about a decade later after you acquire the prion. And so it involves a lot of dementia. And basically the the patient, once they're diagnosed with that dementia, they die within a year in, Kreutz, in CJD, okay? And it's got motor problems and, you know, generally death, but that death typically follows pneumonia, which is something that's commonly, you know, a cause of death in the elderly. So this may be a uh, very low level diagnosed versus what actually occurs. GSS is very different from CJD. It's got a lot of the same symptoms, but they're a little bit different. First of all, with GSS, you don't see the onset until the 40s or 50s in a, in a person. CJD can affect any age individual. Um, also, there's a lot more muscular control issues. There's a lot of motor control issues because it affects the cerebellum a lot more. 
and it has less dementia than, than is common with CJD. FFI is characterized by severe selective atrophy of the thalamus, which is a part of the brain, so basically it withers. And what happens is you have untreatable insomnia and you also stop being able to do a lot of the resting things that you do. A lot of the resting processes like digestion gets messed up, um, heart rate gets messed up, and all sorts of other fun stuff like that. And with FFI, basically they don't know a lot about this one yet. And uh, it's relatively new on the on the horizon, but they do know it is prion caused, but you can see that it's familial, which means you can inherit it. Kuru is the one that first brought attention to prion diseases in humans, and this little boy that's being carried by his mother is an example of a child affected by Kuru. It was first discovered in the 1950s in geographically isolated tribes in the Foray Highlands of New Guinea, because what happens in this group, these tribes, is that they have a religious ceremony in which they honor their dead. Um, and by honoring their dead, they ingest parts of their bodies. So it's a cannibalistic ritual. And more women and children were affected because the males were eating more of the muscle tissue, the meat, off of the dead relative. But the females and children were lower in, in status. And so they got the less prime cuts, if you want to talk about it that way. And so they were eating stuff that was near the brain and spinal cord. And so they were affected by Kuru because these prion diseases hang out there. And so pretty much they think that one person came down with it and then their family members ate it. They came down with it, then their family members, and it basically spread out in a ripple effect. This practice, this religious practice has been outlawed and there haven't been very many cases of Kuru since then. Alpers syndrome is basically the name given to any prion disease that shows up in infants. And remember that humans can acquire prions in two different ways. They can have an acquired infection, which is through diet or following medical procedures like surgery, growth hormone injections, corneal transplants. In other words, there's an infectious agent that we can identify. But there's also some apparent heredity, hereditary Mendelian transmission where it's an autosomal dominant trait. And so it does show up in family lines. Kuru is one of them, FFI is another. Okay, so those are proteins that cause diseases. Now we're gonna look at nucleic acids that cause disease and they are called the viruses. And viruses come in a wide variety of forms, but the basic structure is a protein coat that covers the nucleic acid core. Viruses and prions are not alive. The only characteristic of life that either one of these two things show is reproduction, and that is only within a host cell or host body. There's over 5,000 known viruses since they were first discovered in 1899, and they're about 100 times smaller than a bacterial cell. So viruses can spread in a lot of different ways. Plant viruses are often transmitted from plant to plant by insects that feed on sap, like aphids do. Um, animal viruses are often carried by blood-sucking insects, like the mosquito pictured here. In fact, um, mosquito-vectored, or fly-vectored, because mosquitoes are a type of fly, um, that family is responsible for, it's estimated, over 50% of all human deaths ever. Okay? Ever. That means half of all the people that have ever lived have died because of something transmitted by the bite of a member of the fly family. Think about that a little bit next summer. Okay, so anyway, these disease-bearing organisms are called vectors. Some things like noroviruses and rhinoviruses, like you see here, the, the gentleman sneezing, um, these are transmitted they can be transmitted by coughing and sneezing, but there's other viruses that are transmitted through the fecal oral route. In other words, poor hand washing after you go to the bathroom, then you touch food, you eat it, or you touch your mouth or your face and you eat it, etc. Um, there's also rotaviruses, which can be spread by direct contact with infected children. It causes nasty, massive diarrhea and you're taking care of the child, then you get it. And then HIV is one of the, one of the several viruses that are transmitted sexually.
So the short answer to are all viruses deadly is no. Not all viruses cause disease, and many viruses reproduce without causing any obvious harm to the person that or or the person or the organism that it's infecting. So for example, some viruses like HIV can be chronic. They cause lifelong infections and the virus continues to replicate despite the defense mechanisms that the body has. But viral infections usually cause an immune response and they can be and these immune responses can cl completely eliminate the virus. And vaccines, which were invented far before we even knew that it was a virus causing the disease, give lifelong Im immunity to a viral infection. Antibiotics, and this is important, so I'm going to say it slowly and I want you to pay attention. Antibiotics do nothing to viral diseases. I'm going to say that again. Antibiotics don't do diddly squat to viral infections. And the reason why I'm saying this is because people get a cold or they get the flu, which is also viral, and they go to the doctor and they feel like crap. And so they're like, doctor, I need medicine. And the doctor caves because, you know, it's a money-making operation. Yes, the doctor wants to heal you. Yes, they, they are there to help you. But it's a money-making operation. And so you say, I'm going somewhere else if I don't get medication from you. So he gives medication and he says, well, it's for your secondary infections. Well, that's crap. It's to make you feel better. It's to make you feel like you're doing something about being sick. But basically with the flu or with other viral caused diseases like the common cold, a lot of the rhinoviruses, etc., there's nothing you can do except wait it out. There are some antiviral drugs which can be implicated for life-threatening viral infections, but they are rare. You don't use them very often. And pretty much if you come down with something that you need antivirals, they're going to make a big deal of it and they're going to let you know. But for, for simple stuff where you just feel like, you know, hammered poo for a couple of weeks because you're sick, there's nothing you can do. So stop asking for antibiotics because that creates a perfect situation to create those antibiotic resistant bacteria, which we're already fighting and having bigger and bigger, stronger and stronger doses of these antibiotics to fight. So knock it off. Okay, sorry. Soapbox over. Let's talk about the viral life cycle. The most typical viral life cycle is called the lytic cycle. And the lytic cycle happens in five basic stages. Some people say six. So it starts off with the attachment. And that's where it binds to the surface of the cell and injects its nucleic acid core so that you see the protein coat stays on the outside. The penetration, and that's where, you know, the, the nucleic acid is in there. But I consider attachment and penetration kind of the same thing. Replication, so that's when you start producing viral messenger RNA. So the virus becomes actually part of the DNA of the cell, of the host cell. And the replication is where it starts to hijack the mechanism of the cell. And that goes right into synthesis and assembly because basically you're starting to make the new virus. And then you're putting it together using the cell's machinery. So basically these are tiny little pirates. They're taking over your ship. And then release. Okay, so, and the release happens by lysis. And lysis means to break apart. And with lysis, it's basically like filling up a water balloon too much. So the viruses fill it up until it explodes. And then it releases new viruses and they go do their thing. However, during the lytic cycle, you can have an interruption section, and that's called the lysogenic cycle. And I know this is a very complicated picture. Don't worry about that part. Okay, I'm going to kind of basically explain it. And the lysogenic cycle is you interrupt the lytic cycle and you go into a resting stage, and it just kind of hangs out there. Okay, so it's hanging out. It gets, you know, so it's in the host cell, but it's not doing any damage to the host cell. It's part of the host cell's DNA. So if the host cell splits, you know, during mitosis, it 
goes along for the ride and you have new viruses being carried along with the new host cells and basically it's just sitting there resting and what it's doing is it's waiting for prime conditions to make more viruses and when those prime conditions happen it's called a trigger and that activates the viral DNA to come out of that resting stage and go right back into the lytic cycle and that produces more viruses and then it infects more. So that trigger can be often high stress, hormone changes, free radicals hitting the cell, like, you know, unbound electrons that are banging around. Um, so one of the examples, a prime example of the lysogenic virus is the herpes virus. And there's a ton of different herpes viruses. It's not all genital herpes that causes, you know, the sexually transmitted diseases. There's, they're everywhere. Um, so basically, the herpes virus will first enter the lytic cycle after the first infection and then the lysogenic cycle and travels to the nervous system where it sits in the nerve fibers. Okay, and then it will get triggered and then go back into the lytic cycle. So some examples of herpes viruses besides the genital herpes is chickenpox. Chicken pox can sit there and rest in your body after your initial infection and it sits in those nerve cells and so when uh, nerve fibers and so when you trigger it again much later you get what's called shingles which often is affecting in the face but not always and shingles is horribly painful and there's not deadly squat you can do about it except ride it out tough it out and then you know not cry like a little girl okay so um, that's one and also cold sores are another type of herpes virus that's why when people get a cold sores then they get them over and over and over again as soon as they start to get sick which is why they're called cold sores okay so the main key to preventing viral diseases is hygiene that's the biggest one hygiene practices are something that is severely underlooked at by most people this is an example of a hand and it's showing you the least areas that are washed and if you see here it's the fingertips and your thumbs guess what goes in your mouth folks guess what touches your eyes or your nose or your face or your ears all of the places where where viruses can get in or open wounds that's how they get in boys and girls so wash your hands and make sure that you're paying attention to the correct spots don't just rub it over and over like you're wringing your hands because that's just doing the fronts and the backs of your hands and not even the backs really well so make sure that you're washing all of your hands not just you know oh i'm gonna run it under the water and hope for the best okay so washing your hands and not touching your face when you're sick that's a huge one because that causes massive reinfection so don't touch your face when you're sick you know, touch it with a Kleenex, touch it with something else, but don't touch your face. Don't rub your eyes because that constantly will reinfect you with these viruses. Vector control. That's plain and simple. If you kill the things that are going to transmit the viruses, you, you don't get the viruses. Um, and that also includes surface area decontamination. Light switches and, and, and um, doorknobs are the worst. Keyboards on a computer are horrible for transmitting vi viruses, especially cold viruses. Vaccination is, is a cheap and effective way of preventing infections in, by viruses in humans. And vaccines are used to prevent these viral infections before the discovery of the actual viruses. Like I said, smallpox was the first vaccination and it was used by using the pus from pustules from cowpox because dairy maids didn't get smallpox but they got cowpox so they would take the pustules and they would inject it in your skin and then you didn't get smallpox um, we've come a long way since then obviously but that was the first one and that's why vaccine got its name because cowpox is called vaccinia antiviral drugs are kind of like the the point of last resort and we typically use them for chronic infections things like HIV or things like when you get a disease that you're supposed to get as a child and you don't you get it as an adult then they they get worried because then it can kill you like chickenpox for example okay so that's the two that cause disease that aren't alive let's talk about um, two kingdoms of living organisms and we'll start with the archaebacteria 
So the archaebacteria, I've gone over these characteristics again, but it's worth repeating. They're prokaryotic, they're mostly unicellular, they're asexually reproducing, um, which means, you know, no dinner and a movie needed. Um, they have a cell wall lacking peptidoglycan, and that's important because that's what separates them from the U bacteria. And they're often called extremophiles. In other words, they live in extreme environments where other organisms typically don't live. So this group prob probably represents organisms that are similar to the first cells on the planet because the planet when it was you know cooling and all there was no oxygen in the atmosphere and all that other stuff it was a pretty extreme environment so some of the big examples are halophiles which are the salt lovers and these species can tolerate very high salt environments like brackish ponds salt lakes volcanic vents on the seafloor and the like and most are heterotrophic aerobes in other words they use oxygen but some can switch to a special type of photosynthesis using a, a chemical called bacterial rhodopsin to produce ATP if they don't get ac access to oxygen. So in the Great Salt Lake, that's where you find them. Methanogens. Meth methanogens mean methane makers, and they live in swamps, mud, sewage, and animal guts. And they make ATP anaerobically, in other words, they don't need oxygen, by converting carbon dioxide and hydrogen to methane, and they can harvest ATP off of that process. Thermophiles. The extreme thermophiles are called heat lovers, and these bacteria live in hot springs and other very hot places, such as thermal vents on the seafloor where temperatures can exceed over 110 degrees Celsius, so well above boiling. Um, and they use hydrogen sulfide for ATP formation. The picture on the right I took, and it's at an extremely hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, and you can see the bacterial mats of these extremophiles, these these uh, thermophiles. So, so these are not algae like most people think. These are actually bacterial mats, uh, similar to what you would find in stomatolites that are fossilized. There's also alkali files and acidophiles, so they live where there's extreme bases or extreme acids. Eubacteria. Remember, eubacteria is in its own domain. It's in the bacterial domain and the archaebacteria are in the archaea domain because there's very there's quite a bit of difference between those two groups genetically. So you bacteria are also prokaryotic. They're mostly unicellular, although they can be colonial or multicellular organisms. They're mostly asexually reproducing, just like the archaeobacteria. But they also have what's called pseudosexual trans, um, reproduction, which means that they have a small circle of DNA that's not their main DNA. It's called a plasmid, and they can transmit this plasmid back and forth between bacteria through a little tube that they connect to each other, called a pilus. Well, that's how we get nasty new foodborne illnesses. For example, um, the Jack in the Box E. coli, which you guys are too young to remember, but your parents will. The Jack in the Box E. coli that was killing people is E. coli H 07 H157, or, or I may have gotten the H and the O mixed up. Anyway, that one actually was an E. coli, which generally makes you sick, but it doesn't kill you. Um, but it got a plasmid from a Shigella, which is a type of foodborne illness that does kill you. And so it was able to produce the toxins that kill people. So that's a type of pseudosexual reproduction. And these cell walls contain peptidoglycan. That's the big difference. And you do need to know the basic structure of a eubacterial cell. This is in every book in some similar form, but the keys that you need to understand is it's got the nucleoid. Remember that the nuclear membrane isn't there. It's not separated from the cellular machinery. It does have ribosomes, but again, those aren't membrane bound. Um, it has a capsule and a cell wall and a plasma membrane. So it's got three layers of protection on the outside. Bacteria are often classified by shape. Spirilla are obviously spirals, bacilli are rod-shaped bacteria, and cocci, um, singular is coccus, cocci are spherical or ball-shaped. So you, be, uh, you bacteria pretty much have figured out every type of metabolic pathway on the planet. So if there, there is a metabolic pathway, there's a bacteria that does it. 
Photoautotrophs um, are photosynthetic, and cyanobacteria like this anabena on the right-hand side is one of them. Anabena also can fix nitrogen in these little um, big balls, which are called heterocysts. Green and purple bacteria use hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen gas as a source of electrons for photosynthesis as well. Chemoautotrophs are among the most important. Um, these are the nitrifying bacteria that participate in the nitrogen cycle and also help our plants to grow because they form a symbiotic relationship with plant roots. Um, they use ammonia for generating ATP. And then there's chemoheterotrophs, which are similar to what we are. We're chemoheterotrophs. We eat our food. So chemoheterotrophs, if you think about bacteria that cause disease in humans, they're all chemoheterotrophs. So let's talk about some of the good and the bad bacteria. The pseudomonads are major decomposers in the soil. They're the ones that, that you know, help return you to the environment so that your nutrients can be used. Actinomycetes are bacteria that produce antibiotics to kill other bacteria. We like those. Lactobacillus is used in dairy products, so yogurt, cheese, other types of milk products. Those are all lactobacillus, and they're good for you. They're good for your digestive system as well. E. coli isn't always bad either. E. coli in the right environment, which is inside your gut, produces vitamin K for clotting that you need. Um, rhizobium fixes nitrogen on the roots, and that's examples of the, the cases for rhizobium on the left-hand side. However, some strains of E. coli, if you eat them, uh, can cause serious diarrhea. Some can form resistant endospores that survive harsh environmental conditions. For example, Clostridium botulinum and anthrax also um, can insist, they can sporulate, so that, that means that they can wait in horrible environments. I mean, botulinum is, is something that we have when we can foods. That's why you never eat from dented cans, because that energy from denting it can cause them to start to reproduce and produce toxins. Okay, so you can see the figure on the right is one producing endospores. And Borrelia burgdorferi is a spirochete bacteria, so it's a spirilla, and it lives in ticks. And when the ticks bite humans, it can cause Lyme disease. However, we have harvested some of these bacteria for um, good, good purposes, like the lactobacillus, like um, E. coli we use correctly in our guts, you know, which we're not acquiring it intentionally, but they live there, um, things like that. But there's also some questionable uses of bacteria. Let's talk about Botox. Yay. Okay. So botulism toxin is the most toxic substance known on the planet <laughs> okay so that it has a median lethal dose of about one nanogram per kilogram given iv so okay so that means that 10 a one with eight zeros in front of it as a gram per kilogram of your body so if you weigh 60 kilograms you need 0 0.00000006 grams of this injected into your body to kill you. Okay, it's horrible. And foodborne botulism usually results in the ingestion of food that has become contaminated with spores, and they live in an anaerobic environment which allow them to grow and germinate. And these growing bacteria are the ones that produce the toxin. Okay? Now, botulism, when we ingest it, causes death. Um, infants get wound botulism that, that are a result of an open sore and spores get in there and then they start producing the toxin and it kills you. Now, you know, this is the other soapboxy part. Why would you inject that in your face just to not have wrinkles? I'm just curious. People have died from Botox injections, plain and simple. They're not reported very well, but you can look on the morbidity and mortality reports, which are produced every year, and you can see how many have. But basically what happens is they found out that when people with muscular 
uh, dystrophy were injected with, with Botox, botulinum toxin to help them to move more effectively and not have the palsy, that they also lost their wrinkles. And so somebody said, hey, we can market that. So, you know, just keep that, keep that in mind. Okie dokie, that's going to complete the lecture on prions, viruses, and bacteria. So hopefully um, you've learned a lot from this. It is quite a fascinating topic and far more than I can cover in half an hour. Hope you have a great day. Thanks.